Hello and welcome to episode 23 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 30th of October 2017. I'm Joe and with me are Jesse. Hello Joe. Ike. Happy Halloween, Jesse. <laughs> and Phelan. I want to drink your blood. Yes, recording this the day before Halloween, and you'll probably be listening to this on Halloween. Isn't that exciting? Almost as exciting as the Linux kernel community enforcement statement. <clears throat> we have to cover this. I think it's interesting. It's not massively exciting, but it's certainly new territory in terms of licensing. Uh, how can I make this interesting? Someone save me. Okay, so... If licenses are that you know licenses are important and uh, Linux kernel is under GPL v2, and someone is weaseling their way through it in order to extract money from people by threatening them, and you can't really change. Well, I get the impression you can't change the license, or it's difficult to do so. So they're just adding some words of clarification to stop this guy from weaseling money out of other people. I think one of the interesting things is the fact that software conservancy and kernel developers. We're happy with each other and patting each other on the back for doing the job together, which was funny given that they conservancy brought up wanting to do a talk about this type of stuff a few months back at the plumbers conference and everybody was like, uh, no. So that, that was good. <laughs> I guess if you've, if you've got a common enemy, then, uh, you need to, you need to rally the troops and what have you. But it does, it does sound that all they're doing is writing a little bit that says, by the way, these few lines we think we interpret as this. And so if it ever goes to court again, there's a clear definition as to what this slightly ambiguous uh, line in, in the license means. What seems interesting to me is that there's a lot of talk from the GPLv3 gone into this, which is not a license that Linus was ever interested in applying. So is it a case of them just taking the best bits from that, do you think? Palatable bits, maybe. Could say they're cherry picking. I don't see that as a, as a bad thing necessarily. I mean, one of the ones in this uh, in this blog post that, that Greg's put out says that they've adopted the idea that you get a, a short amount of time to become compliant. Uh, so if you're if it's alerted that you're not compliant, you can take whatever a short amount of time is in lawyer speak, and uh, and you know do something towards it, which seems like a sensible thing. You know, the even the uh, SFS. FSF, I get myself confused. Um, say that they don't go for the, you know, to take people to court straight away. They like to bring people round to their side of their way of seeing things. So this is this is just another way of being able to do that. Well, they want the code and not the money. Exactly. Well, a lot of people are throwing their weight behind the statement, so that kind of bodes well to me. The fact that Linus himself has signed it seems like it is a good thing and if it stops people being litigious for the sake of it and just trying to make money by suing people then that's got to be a good thing hasn't it oh yeah definitely i mean down the line people know they're protected right and that's sort of what it's all about yeah i mean i'm not sure how legally enforceable it is because it's not actually in the license it's an accompanying file isn't it on the, the github or whatever so I'd, I'm not a lawyer. I ain't all, as they say. So we'd probably better move on from that. Let's talk about Linux Mint. We don't normally talk about Linux Mint. And when we do, we don't generally have that much good to say about the project. <laughs> or at least I don't. <laughs> Is that Firefox profile going for <laughs> Yeah. Um, but they have decided to back Flatpak, essentially. So they've integrated that into the software center. And they are not shipping SnapD by default by the looks of things. Certainly not in the latest release and probably not in the uh, the next one, which makes you wonder what's going on. Why are they doing this? Is it a political statement to try and distance themselves even more from Ubuntu or what? I don't think it's a political thing at all. I think this is actually an example of Mint doing things right. If you look at their ecosystem now, like with X apps and, you know, which is like forks of apps or forks of forks of the norm apps, a lot of the flat pack stuff, you can get the vanilla norm stuff and rely on the newer base. And a while back, Mint decided we're only going to do LTS bases now. So they got older base older apps and forks of the apps. So that side of the ecosystem, they don't really have access to for their users. Whereas with Flatpak, they suddenly would. 
yeah, so something like Flatpak or Snap would make a lot of sense for Mint, as you say, because they're sitting on the LTS. And so there's a lot of discussion about the fact that they you don't get the most up to the apps and what have you. But I don't understand if they're uh, downstream of Ubuntu and Ubuntu is obviously all in on Snaps, why wouldn't you just sit on top of that as a solution? I, I don't see in this post where Flatpak has one out over snap especially as their upstream is the you know is the absolute core of where snaps are coming from i can think of a good reason at the moment snapd doesn't have full desktop integration it doesn't have full theme integration whereas flatback actually does and that's something that mint have been very vocal about being important to to them before they've complained loudly a lot of times about gtk theme integration and I think that's something that would matter to them slightly more, as well as obviously having all of those no maps available. But towards the end of their blog post on um, blog.linuxmint.com, they do say, compared to packages, there are a few subtle differences. Flatpak apps use the Adwaita GTK theme, brackets, use Mint X, Mint Y eventually. So out the box, they are using a default theme, and they're going to have to do some work by the looks of it to get their theme in. Is that just tweaking the settings and what have you within flat packs in order to see their theme and use it which is what it sounds like or are they going to have to do more work than that to get it themed as nicely as they want it to be the vast majority of the flat pack apps out there at the moment they do support because uh alex larson did a lot of work there and the other guys so they have like these theme extension points and a lot of the themes are already flat packed so they would just have to flat pack their if you like non-standard themes because they are mint specific. They would have to flat pack those up. Yeah. And then you'd install that flat pack. It would then become available to the environment within inside, inside the flat pack container because it can't see the outside file system. So it doesn't have a copy of the theme, but it can, it's allowed to talk to deconf, which is where it gets all its settings from, which tells it this is GTK theme. This is the icon theme. So it knows what the settings should be. It just doesn't have those inside the file system, but you can flat pack up themes. So they become available to that flat pack. I've said flat pack a lot of times now. <laughs> <laughs> so they would become available to it. And then because it can see the setting and it has a version available locally, it can also use that theme. So that's. I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but that's kind of the direction they'd have to go there. Just get the mint theme slap packed up and then out of the box stuff would work for many of the default themes. So I think in terms of the path of least resistance, I think flat pack is there for theme integration for them. But these technical arguments weren't convincing enough for you to pick flat pack alone for Solus. Yeah, I mean, we got flat pack and snap, but then so has mint. You could install Snap as well. I mean, so of the Ubuntu's. For me, though, it was never about the, the no maps. I mean, I'm only guessing I might be totally wrong, you know, but I would assume it would involve the GTK apps that they would have access to. But for me, it's always been about the third party software I couldn't distribute. So stuff like the theme integration really doesn't matter that much because a lot of the apps, like, uh, I can't even think of one off the top of my head, but well, Chrome never really sits nicely, does it? Yeah, I mean they've got their own custom theming stuff going on, and it's taken a while to integrate it in Solus. And I know that the theme integration stuff is coming. Uh, I, I guess another thing that would be important for them from their software center, Flatpak thinks in terms of repos, and you can list the contents of those repos. Whereas SnapD is designed around a store, so you can't really at the moment do a listing of say a component. Whereas you could do that underneath Flatpak, whereas SnapD, you'd actually have to do an asynchronous search to the remote store to find out what's in that bit, and then it will show you some of them. So in terms of integration into a software center, it's a little bit harder to get Snap because everything is remote instead of local, like the Flatpak repo is cached locally. So there's also that part of it as well. So I think Flatpak would be a hell of a lot easier for them to integrate. Um but it, it depends what you want out of them. Like for me, I don't really care about the home apps because I have them anyway and it's roll and release. We're not locked to an LTS. Mint is locked to an LTS, can't get the newer stuff. So I think, you know, they're, they're very different arguments, very different needs. I only need random third party bits. They're looking at apps. And yeah, I think it kind of makes sense for them. But one of the points they make in this is, in this blog post, is that 
they like the fact that flat packs have uh, don't rely on a man in the middle um, between the person who produces the. Uh, I want to use a generic word for snap and flat pack, uh, the binary and the user. So whereas with snap you have to use the snap store, with flat packs anyone can publish their application on their own server, and you can just add that. I suppose a bit like a PPA, you just add to say where you want to look for that snap, and it'll download it. You can download and install a snap locally. Yeah, exactly. So they could integrate it into their software center. Uh, a system where it just basically w gets it and then runs a command um, snap install and then the path to the the thing it's downloaded the snap it's downloaded and let's not forget in the i believe in the screenshots it's showing flat hub enabled as default well, that's somebody else's repo exactly that's the hypocrisy of the whole thing they're saying like oh we don't want to use snap because we can't control it well you can control it and they they're not even hosting their own stuff anyway I guess the the argument there is like at the moment it's it's a case of who owns the keys. Like you you can use a repo, but you can also set up another repo. At the moment, as much as it's technically possible to create a snap store, it, nobody's ever really done it. I mean, there was like a, a proof of concept a while back, but there's no programmatic support for telling SnapD like I want to add these remote sources. You talk to the store. So in that, that respect, they're kind of right as well, because you can't just say, like, add this repo and get from there. It's like it's in the store. To be fair, you can publish your stuff and you, you, you can tell it, you know, you want to publish to this channel. But it's not like you can just set up a store on your server. You can you can host the snap, but you wouldn't have, like, update paths and stuff available. So it, it, it's definitely a bit of both. If you want to... Uh, benefit from the update paths you'd have to have it in the store or tell somebody to download it whereas with the flat pack path you know it's got that local index it knows when there is updates it'll update from them anyone can then create a repo so i mean there's arguments for and against it but in terms of what they're trying to do i do think they made the logical decision but obviously i think you know ideally everyone would support both yeah, and I suppose because it is basically Ubuntu underneath, it does support Snap, even if it's not first-class support. Yeah, it's sort of like out-of-the-box experience. What are we in the grave of default? Blah, blah, blah. Have this. That's yeah. kind of cool. But users will still have that choice. You know, They'll still have their dev packages. They'll also still have Flatpak and Snap available through the underlying repos themselves. Yeah. So they also announced that they're dropping the KDE edition. Do we care about that? Failing, I presume you don't. No, I, I, re, I never really saw the point in it, to be honest, because I thought the Kubuntu guys did a better job anyway. Um, and, well, my my hatred of non-toolkit uh, crossing takes over where they were quite keen on having a KD desktop that they would say, oh, yeah, and you should use whatever the other apps at the time were for uh, audio. Like, I don't know. They didn't quite say use Rhythmbox for music and stuff, but it was close on it, and I always that jarred with me a little bit, so... What, you mean they had some applications that didn't start with a K? Yes. Down <laughs> with that sort of thing. Can you imagine using like a search on a menu when every single time you want to search something, you have to press the K first? <laughs> it doesn't filter anything out. <laughs> Fuck <Fine, laughs> Everything is still there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We're all white supremacists, really. <laughs> what? Oh, I just got that. Wow. <laughs> I kind of think that Mint's making good moves here because... They've definitely nodded to Kubuntu in their post, right? They they more than nodded in their post when they were talking about dropping the KDE edition. And they're still going to support it for another amount of time, and then it will go away. But it, it kind of seems like they're refocusing on their core, and the ancillary stuff is starting to go away. So all the same, out-of-the-box experience, you know, in our software center, we will support Flatpak. We won't have the KDE edition. If you want that, well, those guys over there, they're dedicated to that. That's not quite us. It conflicts with our core stuff. We're very GTK, so it feels like they're making positive decisions. Yeah, it's better that they don't kind of make a mess of something that they're not really overly keen on either. I, I don't know whether there was a separate person that was doing the KD stuff or not. I don't know. but A while back there was. I remember Boo uh, was responsible for that for a long time, but... I mean, most of their stuff, most of their custom applications, like the X apps, that's all GTK. Their software center, again, is GTK. And then having to try and duplicate that stuff across the Qt as well, you know, you can sort of see that it doesn't really jive with their core stuff 
at all. And back when they would have started it, it would have been uh, an alternative because it was an alternative to the core Ubuntu experiences. But nowadays, the the KDE branch of the Ubuntu family is slightly diverged, and you know we have Neon as well. So the the options are definitely there for a very updated stack, and people want shiny, updated plasma nowadays. They don't want the older version on an LTS base. It's just not what people are going for anymore. All right, well, let's talk about ZFS. We will talk about this later in an interview that we have already recorded. That's a bit of a mind bender, but we'll get back to that. But specifically, a story that's gone around in the last couple of weeks that Oracle could, keyword, still make ZFS work with Linux license-wise. And this came out of the Open ZFS Developer Summit. What do we think about this? Is this just dreaming or is this possibly going to happen? Are we going to get um, uncontroversial ZFS on Linux? Well, we're, if we do get it, it's going to be Oracle ZFS, not Open ZFS, because that diverged a while ago. No, well, it'll be ZFS. <laughs> no, it'll be ZFS. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's a license that is compatible with the kernel, then it will be forkable anyway, and you could make open, open, or Libra ZFS. But all of the new contributions that went into Open ZFS for the past almost ten years is diverged already, and you'd have to either get permission of everybody who is involved in that to relicense or try and port any of the changes back in, or get those agreeable sides to join in their code. You essentially be starting from. 2010 all over again okay can i can i just ask the idiot zfs question uh on ubuntu what zfs is installed open zfs and that's the one that's on bsd as well yeah it's the one that's all used and developed from oracles originally way back and then a bunch of different companies started working on it okay so no one really gives a shit about oracle zfs anyway only Oracle does, and I don't think they really care about it either. <laughs> well, I mean, Solaris is slowly, slowly sort of dead. There's still one guy who's trapped in a cubicle somewhere and can't get out because they've walled him in by mistake. He's doing support. Everybody thought it was dead, and then a tweet went up with a blog post. It's like, no, it still exists. What? <laughs> <laughs> but surely, if Oracle ZFS were to be relicensed, then that would at least make it possible for open zfs to be licensed i know it would be a big job contacting all the people who've contributed but you, there'd be more weight behind that movement surely you've got a lot of people there that are sort of possibly not even into linux having zfs anyway i mean there's people out there with products that are based on bsd Maybe they, maybe they don't want Linux to come and steal <laughs> the only thing they have going for them right now. Yeah, that's kind of an awkward one. Like, if the underlying code is relicensed, what happens to the code on top? It's a separate project now at this point, surely. Probably. It's probably diverged far too far anyway. We should just relicense the kernel itself, put it under a BSD license. And you just start using butterfest it's fine just just forget all that zfs nonsense and just carry on a good proper licensed file system <laughs> yeah as long as, as long as you don't like like your data or anything yeah if you, if you have no data storage needs then butterfest that's for you i am pretty sure zfs went through exactly all of these things we just didn't get to see any of it because they were hiding it away yeah we didn't get to slag it off <laughs> mm. well as i said more on that in an interview, well, it's not really an interview, it's a chat that we had with someone mysterious. Ooh, you'll have to wait 10 minutes or so. Um, all right, well, let's talk about Ubuntu again, and specifically Canonical here. When they made the huge announcement, we kind of thought that Shotworth was preparing to sell Canonical or maybe go public with it. Well, he has confirmed that the plan is to take some investment once they get profitable properly and then prepare for an IPO. So he's going to sell out, basically. And fair play to him. He's he spent a long time investing his money and time into this, and he's going to get a big fat payday. Hmm. Skepticism. I mean, I'll give him a five or four. 
start the bidding at Fiverr. Anyone yeah, else? I mean, I might have to owe him the Fiverr. But, you know. <laughs> but one of the things that I thought was interesting from this uh, this article was that he said that even now Canonical is profitable. If he got hit by a bus, is his quote, uh, it would survive. It doesn't need him inputting money, which I was still under the impression that as a whole, Canonical was losing money, but turns out it's profitable and and these changes that they're making you know refocusing on uh the desktop well refocusing mostly on servers and clouds and iot and infrastructure and stuff and minimizing the amount of wasted time on their own desktop environment the phone the tv blah blah, blah will only make it leaner and trimmer and more sellable maybe seven pounds <laughs> do i see seven pounds eight <laughs> I don't know, man. It's all about growth, isn't it, in the tech industry, and I suppose in any industry. And if now they are profitable, which he's said they are, so you kind of have to believe him, they fired all the people who weren't making them any money or laid them off. Awkward. (laughs) Yeah. Well, my understanding is that they are making a fair bit of money on the IoT and the cloud and stuff, and, and more importantly, that that is growing, and growth is what makes a successful IPO. And so if my beliefs are proven right and they will have to open their books up when they are going to IPO, and if they are really growing like I think they are, then it's a good bet. And I would advise people to buy some shares because I think that it's going places as a company. I could be totally wrong, but that's just my hunch on this. I think we need this as well, though. I think we need somebody other than just Red Hat. I mean, not that Red Hat are like evil cackling on top of the mountain with lightning in the background. But, you know, there's got to be somebody other than them that's out there because otherwise it just, it totally skews the the landscape of stuff. I mean, you know, they have their ways of doing stuff. They fund system D even though nobody wanted to. And you can say that's good or bad, whatever, but there was no one else there to counter that. And I think there's got to be something they're in a professional sense that can sort of say, well, oh, we're going to do it this way. And just so there is more than just one choice. Sousa and Richard Brown are probably saying, yes, that's us. And I'd say, <laughs> no, <laughs> on you go, son. But yeah, whatever. Well, they're growing as well. And you never know. Although they just keep getting bought and the company that owns them keeps getting bought. So who even knows what's going on with their finances? I mean, when your primary output is parody videos. <laughs> I'm only joking. It's only yeah. half. Cool songs. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Failing, when you say you need another choice, what, what do you mean it's another choice? What, what's to stop companies using Canonical and their support presently versus if they have this uh, IPO shenanigans go on? Well, I, I don't think there's anything to stop them right now. I mean, I think that's good. But what I would hate to see is the fact that the likes of Microsoft buys them or something like that, where they become a private division inside of another company and then they either get killed off or sort of mutated in such a horrible way that they're like changed from what they, how they got there. Uh, I want them to continue to grow as they are growing in the right areas and doing the right thing and with the same ethos, not yeah, you're a pesky sort of competitor, right? Let's do away with you like the way so many other companies seem to go in the tech world where it's like, oh, wow, they've got a competing product better than ours. We've got loads of money. Let's buy them and kill them. Brilliant. Job done. But if they go public, then what's stopping Microsoft or Amazon buying a shitload of shares and potentially a controlling stake? Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. I mean, if Microsoft buy them, that's going to take the whole, you know, Windows subsystem for Linux a little bit far. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, it it seems like the only companies in a position to buy them realistically would be Amazon, Facebook. (laughs) Or Red Hat. (laughs) Well, yeah, maybe. There are probably a lot of other companies out there, but just the the ones that you would think, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, HPE, that kind of thing. Yeah, maybe. But I, I suppose public is better than an acquisition, isn't it? Just about. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because I was preparing. I mean, we talked about it at the time that if uh, if Microsoft buy them, then we'll be moving to, oh God, we might even have to move to Solus. Ah, no. It's never going to be that bad, surely. Could be BSD. <laughs> no. Yeah. Wait, which is worse? <laughs> Actually, don't answer that. Yeah. So uh, what do we think of the name of 1804 then? <laughs> Bionic Beaver. <laughs> 
<laughs> last last week it was nonsense. This week it's beavers. As long as every time you do something, like click a key or click on an icon, it goes. Uh, see, I'm just about old enough to remember that reference, Faden, but the Bionic Man. But I think the other two are too young. Bloody whippersnappers! <laughs> what are they going to do when they get to R? It'll go back to raring ring piece again, won't it? <laughs> a rampant rabbit, or maybe isn't that a? Uh, uh, let's not go there, shall we? <laughs> um, right. Well, I can't believe that I am going to give you more publicity for this, I keep. Ah, go on. Ah, go on. You want help <laughs> with art, and you're not going to pay. Oh, with art, right. I mean, in general, yeah, definitely want help, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did I explain well? Yeah, that was excellent. Right, let's move on. Yeah, that's our sales pitch done. <laughs> I've read the headline. There's a, a Solus 4 coming out, and he wants it to look pretty. That That's kind of it. Um, want it to make it look more better And you want a slideshow and install a slideshow? Well, I said the reason we didn't have an installer slideshow before is I possessed the artistic talents of a camel, and they are not plentiful. So that's the reason we don't have stuff like that, because I just can't do that stuff. So if people want to help out, because we got like a month or so-ish until we actually do the release, because normally we don't tell people to like a week before. It's like, ah, we're doing release. And everyone's like, yeah, we sort of guessed. So this time telling people plenty, plenty of time in advance if they want to help out with it or get some artwork into there, some pictures. Safe for work pictures, though. <laughs> Can someone please make a wallpaper that is just black? Yeah, minimalism. Well, that's what I have, and you can't set in GNOME. So if you had the GNOME version, you basically can't. You have to go and download a, a background image <laughs> that is black. You, the, you've got various solid colors, and the closest one's like a sort of light gray. Are your eyes allergic to joy or something? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, would you not be the worst thing if you accidentally downloaded a JPEG <laughs> and you just had all like this blocky black in the background? Mind you, it'd add to the texture though, wouldn't it? I just like a nice black background on my desktop and on my phone as well. I just, I just don't need a picture there. This idea of you see these, um, like on Imgur and stuff and, and Reddit, whatever, like wallpaper dump. Like, I just have no interest in having a stupid fucking picture. Uh, just plain black, please. Thank you very much. Pick a pick a nice picture rather than a stupid fucking one. Yeah, no, John. It, even it's just distracting. I just uh. well, we've changed our minds. We won't be looking for our work for Solus Four. We've seen a remedy. <laughs> it's kind of a nineteen twenty by ten eighty black PNG. Yeah, exactly. It's like the fast show. Black, black. <laughs> you know the guy painting the pictures. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's oh, for man. tea, mother? You really are digging out the old school references. First it was <laughs> 70s, now it's 90s. Uh, it'll be uh, Little Britain next. Shut up. <sighs> anyway, right, so this episode of Late Night Linux is sponsored by Entroware. And Entroware are a dedicated Linux computer seller based here in the United Kingdom. And they sell computers with Ubuntu and Ubuntu Mate 1604 and 1710. And they've got all sorts of laptops and a couple of desktops and a server ranging from fairly low-end affordable stuff all the way up to real powerhouses that have got the latest NVIDIA chips in them and are suitable for graphic design and 3D art and video editing, that sort of thing. You see, when you said all sorts of laptops and these sorts of things, I looked on it the other day, and they have seven laptops available and like four desktops. It's not that you've got a choice of one or two. It's, It's a fantastic range. Yeah, and most of them are configurable. You can change CPUs and amounts of RAM and storage and that sort of thing. So you can pretty much find a machine to suit you and your budget. And they ship to the United Kingdom, Republic of Ireland, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And if you do buy one of the machines, then mention us at checkout, and then they'll know we sent you. So go to entroware.com for all your Linux computing needs. On to a bit of admin then. And first of all, thank you to everyone for supporting us on PayPal and Patreon. And it's funny, I was listening to the excellent Waking Up podcast uh, produced by Sam Harris recently, and he was talking about his Patreon people, and he was basically urging people to support him, but only if they could afford it. He said, if the idea of an extra coffee a week or a month means nothing to you, just like five quid on a, a coffee while you're out means nothing, then 
please donate to the podcast. But if you're on a really tight budget, then don't, don't bother. Uh, he doesn't need your money that much. And I kind of agree with that, that the show is free and we want as many people to listen to it as possible. But if you are in a position where you can afford to easily support it and keep us going, then please do. There's no obligation, obviously. Some people on Patreon do paywalls and stuff like that and have extra bonus content, but we're not really interested in that. It's just too much effort. The bottom line is the show is free, but we really welcome support. So um, yeah, go to latenightlinux.com slash support, and there's links to the Patreon page and PayPal and various other ways to uh, contribute if you want to join the excellent people who already are. And spread the word and join the Telegram group to make sure we have more than the Ubuntu podcast. <laughs> yeah, although I don't know, we just end up with spammers and... Uh, we seem to have both settled on about 610-ish or something. It's numbers, Joe. We need to have more, even if they're spammers. <laughs> yeah, stop kicking them out, Joe. Yeah, but you make a good point about spreading the word. If you think someone might be interested, tell them about it, whether that's IRL or on Reddit or some forum somewhere. If you link to us, then I'll see it in the logs. So I will uh, thank you silently. Yeah, and there's ways of leaving feedback, whether it be on Telegram, um, on Google+, uh, on the website, whatever you. And I just wanted to get to uh, a bit of feedback that Will wrote uh, to do with the Libra 5 that we talked about on the last show. And he said, uh, I'm very interested to see where the Libra 5 goes, but I'm sceptical of the user experience. Android is pretty aggressive about controlling battery life and memory usage. Customizing Debian to behave like that would take some work, I think. And desktop applications may not translate well to the phone. And... I just sort of, it hadn't been something that really occurred to me about the fact that, yes, it's a great idea to use Linux on a phone, all those sorts of great things, but you do forget, or I'd forgotten, all the things that Android has done to make that tiny little battery and, and all the, the weird features that phones have, um, you know, being turned on and off all the time and, you know, just the lock screen and is different and the touch interface, all those sorts of things. There's, there's a lot to be done to make Linux work on a phone even not even thinking about the the user interface, just those background tasks and things. So uh, there's an interesting point you made. I, I thought I'd share it. Don't worry, they've got $2 million. That will easily pay for all of that stuff. Yeah, of course it will, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, here's hoping. It is a, a massive, massive task. And I think that if you have backed that, and I think they're still taking pre-orders, you have to set your expectations. It's not going to be as good as android and ios it's just that's impossible but it is going to hopefully be totally free software and that is the main thing isn't it yeah i wonder i wonder how long we we should give them before we say this is not working because obviously version one is <laughs> but like what i'm saying is is version one is not going to be great get the bats out already <laughs> we could say it is working <laughs> version one is not going to be great and you've just said that we all agree with that but when version seven is out and you're still not, it's still a bit shit at some point, you know, because they just can't put the amount of money and resources and development that Android does uh, or Google does with Android and, and iOS, what have you. And, you know, if Microsoft can't make these things work, what hope is there for like a little sort of, uh, yeah, I don't have the right phrase for it, but a, a smaller company. A startup, basically. Well, the thing is this, right? Even if they plug away for five years at this and they get five years more advanced, well, Android and iOS will be a further five years advanced, so they'll always be playing catch-up. And that's something that plagued the Ubuntu phone, I think, that you've got a moving target and they are accelerating away from you with all the billions of dollars they can spend on it, and it becomes impossible to compete with them on a level playing field, features and stuff-wise. But that's not what the Libra 5 is about, is it? It's ultimately about free software and open source and all that kind of goodness. And I think that it will always be framed in that way. So I just don't think that it will ever be as good, for want of a better word. There's, there's two points that I would say. Firstly, who says you have to compete directly with Android and, and iOS? I know you're saying, you're saying that they're going forward as the rate that you're catching up, but who says you're actually able to catch them? And also they are at least able to learn from the mistakes of Android. So, you know, let's just call them mobile phone OSs. So a mobile phone OS has learned what is good for touching and swiping and app development and interface design. And they've t it's taken years and thousands of people using them to get to the point that those systems are at. 
And you can just look at them and say, okay, this seems to work nicely. We'll have our settings menu like that. Done. You don't have to start from Idiotsville back in 2007. So, you know, that you're, you're not necessarily striving for Android, which, uh, you know, as you said, it's for, for enthusiasts, but also they're not starting from zero, are they? Well, uh, a bit more than just looking at it, seeing what they're doing and learning, because there's the actual code as well, which, okay, the interface and stuff is one thing, but all the underlying battery optimizations and stuff, that is um, actual code that I don't think you can just learn from. You could look at Android and say, hmm, it used to have really shit battery life. Now it's got slightly less shit battery life. Let's do that, because that was 10 years of development to make that happen behind closed doors. Although I suppose the code is mostly available, so maybe they can, but it's all about play services and stuff. Who knows? But all right, let's move on. Jesse and Phelan, you were absent for this, so it's just going to be me and Ike. Uh, So let's listen to the interview slash chat. So we're now joined by Jim Salter, who is so famous, he's even written for Ars Technica. Wow. So welcome, Jim. (laughs) Thanks. So that is how we ended up getting in touch, because I cited an article that you had written, uh, I think it's three or four years ago now, and you said, hey, that's me, and we got talking. And that was about next generation file systems. So basically ZFS, ZFS if you're American, and um, ButterFS, FS. I think we'd better say ZFS and ButterFS, but whatever. Anyway, and then you offered ages ago to come and tell us about this, and I finally got around to it. Here we are. So what makes you think that you are qualified to espouse the virtues of these file systems? Oh, the justify your existence thing. Well, uh, you know, besides writing articles on them, uh, I have my own ZFS-related project called Sanoid that uh, does snapshot management and replication between machines. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. That's actually one of the things that I really love about ZFS. I can replicate a 10 terabyte uh, virtual machine image across like a one megabit DSL connection in just a few minutes. That is presumably after already pushing the big bit first. Yes. Once. Yes, that is an incremental, but uh, go ahead, try that with rsync sometime and let me know how you get on. <laughs> yeah. So we're not just talking about ZFS here, we're talking about ButterFS. Um, I suppose, what is the what are the big differences apart from licensing? Well, there's a lot of big differences besides licensing, one being that ZFS actually works. Um, I, I used Butter for a couple of years, and I actually took stab at it in production for close to a year, and it's just not reliable enough. Um, there are a ton of feature differences. Butter has different topologies available than ZFS does, and it has some things that are really cool for like, you know, home or, or hobbyist types like being able to just reshape an array on the fly that ZFS can't do, at least right now, although that may be changing. But the problem is it just, it tends to crash. Uh, It usually won't actually eat your data, but it's very likely to get itself into an unrecoverable state. If you're doing much of anything more complicated than like, oh, I'm running butter on like my one disk in my laptop. But it is more flexible than ZFS, isn't it? Uh, It's differently flexible than ZFS. I wouldn't necessarily (laughs) say more. Well, like um, changing the RAID level and um, shrinking pools and stuff, you can't do with ZFS. Yeah, that's the the rebalancing and reshaping on the fly I was talking about. Um, but it's it's not as hard and fast as a difference as you might think. Um, in Butter, you can do something like you can add a disk to an existing Butter RAID 5 array. So you can go from five disks to six in that array. Whereas you can't add a disk to an existing, uh, you know, RAID Z1 or RAID Z2 in ZFS right now, although that is actually supposed to be changing very soon. Um, But the thing is, well, for one thing, if you've got a Butter RAID 5 array, then you're really screwing up because they literally tell you not to use that code. So what's the point? And another is that if you want flexible storage topology in ZFS, you should probably be doing a pool of mirrors. So say you have the same, you know, six disks and you have them set up as three uh, mirror VDEVs in the pool, you can add another mirror later. Uh, You can also upgrade disks within the VDEV. So say you've got a uh, two disk uh, mirror in ZFS made of two terabyte drives and you go out and buy a couple of new, uh, you know, HE eight terabyte drives. You can just replace those disks in that mirror. And once they're both replaced, poof, you got an, you know, eight terabytes available instead of two. So all this is basically sysadmin talk. And 
I think that you get a lot of sysadmins listening to our show. I, well, I know we do, but there's also a lot of just sort of desktop users as well. And are there any real benefits to desktop users using one of these next generation file systems? Oh, absolutely. There's huge benefits for normal users um, at the simplest level. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to stick to ZFS here because at this point, I don't really recommend that anybody use Butter. You certainly can, but you're playing it kind of risky if you do. Not a big fan of SUSE then, eh? Might want to tell Fedora that as well. Uh, well, uh, F- Fedora knows, trust me. Uh, Red Hat doesn't really want anything to do with Butter in general. And SUSE had to turn off the features that everyone's scared of. Exactly. Um, basically, the only way SUSE is really using it is, like I said before, like, you know, single disk, like in a laptop. Uh, once you start hitting arrays, mm-mm, not so much. Um, but yeah, anyway, so uh, both of these file systems are checksumming file systems, which means that every single block of data that you write is individually cryptographically checksummed. And what that means is it knows when something goes wrong with it. Um, if you've ever had like, you know, an MP3 that suddenly has a bright chirp in it in the middle and you're like, eh, was that always there? It probably wasn't. Uh, similarly, you know, when you got like, old movies that you perfectly legally acquired through various means on the internet. (laughs) And, uh, you know, you see like you're watching it and you're like, this is my favorite movie. I've watched it a million times. I know it didn't always have like that blocky mess of crap in the middle. Um, Again, probably at some point, something went wrong with your storage. It might've been while you were copying it. Uh, Maybe you've got a wiggly SATA cable, whatever. But where a normal file system just, it's corrupt now and that's all there is to it, with ZFS or Butter, they know about it immediately because that block didn't match its checksum. So uh, if you've got redundant storage, you know, like a mirror or like, you know, RAID Z1 or RAID 5 or whatever, it'll automatically correct it on the fly. Um, if you don't have redundant storage, if you're keeping backups, you'll know immediately, hey, I need to go to backup and retrieve that file. Whereas again, with a normal file system, unless you're some way like, you know, MD5 summing every single file on your disk, you wouldn't know until it's too late. But if you've got a single disk set up, how do you know that something's been corrupted? Does it tell you? Uh, it'll tell you anytime that you read it. And uh, more importantly, if you're using ZFS, you should be scrubbing it. A scrub, basically, you just schedule it to run periodically. Like, I have my system scrub once a month, and uh, it goes through every single block and makes sure that it matches its checksum. And if it doesn't, again, it corrects it if you've got a redundant setup, like a pair of disks. And uh, if you don't have a redundant setup, then it'll at least let you know that you have checksums and where, and you can restore that from backup. This kind of reminds me of running defrag on Windows every month. Um, in the sense that you do it once a month? Yes. Other than that, I have no idea what you're on about. <laughs> I mean, the manual interactive maintenance of the file system by the user. Sure. Um, I guess. <laughs> but if you've got a file that you haven't used and you're not going to use for a long time, how long is it backed up for? How, how many snapshots typically do you have? How far back in time can you go? Um, so if you if you never use that file, if you if it just like sits on your disk untouched, it will literally that file will take literally no more space each time you take a snapshot. Um, that's kind of the beautiful thing about snapshots, and not just the whole file. Um, let's say that you've got, and I'll go back to VM images because I love virtual machines. But let's say that uh, you fire up a uh, hacks bit, you know, Windows virtual machine just for a minute because you needed to do something that would only work in some Internet Explorer web app for your job or whatever. Well, you've only touched a few megabytes worth of storage on that virtual machine image, right? Even if that's a, say, a 200 gigabyte VM image, when you next take that snapshot, it doesn't have to take up that whole 200 gigs of that image. It only takes up the couple of megs that you wrote to it while you had it booted up. So it's pretty awesome. Um, To answer your question about what I keep, I generally keep 30 hourlies, 30 dailies, and three monthlies. And those are automatically kept and uh, they're, they're automatically taken, rotated and uh, purged as they expire past policy by my own ZFS project, Sanoid. Fair enough. We can't avoid licensing any longer. It's a bit of a boring topic, but the bottom line is that unless you're canonical and deluded, some would say, or confident, others would say, ZFS and Linux are just incompatible license-wise. There have been rumblings in the last week that Oracle might be thinking maybe about changing the license, but for now, they're incompatible, according to most distros. So how do you get around that? It sounds like you use Ubuntu. 
Uh, I do use Ubuntu, um, and I used Ubuntu before Canonical brought ZFS into the main repos. The thing about the licensing is that it's very easy to just make a blanket statement, oh, these licenses are incompatible, but A, it hasn't been tested in court, and B, it's not as clear-cut as you might think just from listening to, you know, say, the Software Freedom Conservancy. You mean the FSF and, and Conservancy might be wrong about something? Surely not. Well, let's just suppose they might be a little biased about licensing. Let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> but who is going to be brave enough to actually test that outside of your canonicals? So for an example, I run a distro, but then again, I don't have an army of lawyers, so I wouldn't be one to take that risk. And there's a lot of even large companies who don't want to take the risk of actually having it tested in court. Um, I, I think that you and those large companies are not really paying much attention to what the licenses actually state. Uh, there's nothing in either license that causes you to be unable to use the software together. Everything in the license that could possibly conflict centers around distribution. So if you were to put, if you, Ike, were to put ZFS in your main repos, um, there would be an argument that you're distributing it, but even then, probably not because it's in separate modules. Um, what actually happens is you, as the user, load that kernel module, and you're just using the two pieces of code together. Neither license prohibits that. What you can't do is you can't ship them. So you would look at it from more like the dynamic linking end of the argument. Correct. Okay. But then it still does have to be shipped. I mean, you wouldn't be shipping a VM image, which was, say, ZFS pre-enabled, but you would be enabling it from the installer level and shipping something that would be installed with it by default. And I think once you get all those confusions, and that's why a lot of people aren't touching it, and I think it's mostly in the hopes that somebody else does, because I think people actually want it. <laughs> I think people want to see this finally swept away. Well, somebody else did. Canonical did. Um, it really wasn't that big a surprise to me when they did, because, uh, again, despite a lot of the rumblings from the SFC and the FSF, um, I was intensely interested in this because I really, really wanted to be able to, you know, put the chocolate and the peanut butter together years before Canonical uh, started shipping ZFS in the repositories. And even, you know, even more importantly than that, I wanted to be able to use my own project that depended on Linux and on ZFS. And uh, I co-authored a paper with an IP attorney that was presented at POSCON, an open source conference here in South Carolina. And uh, I fed him information about the licenses and gave him links to everything and some background information. And he basically did all the research as a lawyer and decided, you know, would I be comfortable taking on a case with this? And his conclusion was like, yes, I think this would absolutely stand up. Um this is considerably more aggressive, but he felt like, I think I could probably make this float even if you just put ZFS statically in the kernel. Um, the, the other thing about that, and again, this is a thing that a lot of people are kind of scared to talk about. Nobody on the free software side really wants to test this particular one in court because there's no good outcome from doing it. Either one of two things happens. Uh, either mixing the cuddle and the GPL gets upheld in court and it potentially weakens GPL enforcement, or users are forced no longer to use pieces of free software together, which neither the FSF nor the SFC truly want to happen. Well, I, for one, controversially, would happily see the GPL weakened for this <laughs> to be usable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other questions, I'm, uh, I'm not entirely sure, like, can Oracle just suddenly and magically relicense everything GPL or Apache or MIT or whatever. Um, I don't know to what degree they do or don't own all of the contributions in their chunk of the code base. And for that matter, even if they do that, the other interesting thing is I don't think many people are going to want to suddenly want, you know, use Oracle ZFS instead of OpenZFS. They're not the same code base at this point. Now, Oracle might very well be able to say, okay, everything that we ever owned, which would include the entire, you know, pre-acquisition code base and pre-open ZFS code base, all of that is now GPL or all of that is now BSD. But would all of the contributors to the open ZFS code base since open ZFS started be okay with changing the license? I don't know the answer to that. It's kind of hard to change licenses when you have a ton of contributors, you know? Mm. So do you foresee the situation we've got now continuing where we've got this kind of limbo and it seems like you're all right to use it with Ubuntu and if you really want to use it, then just use Ubuntu and just don't worry too much about it? 
If I had to guess, and it sounds like you're forcing me to, then yeah, I think that's the most likely outcome. Um, I think probably people are going to come to the conclusion that if, uh, you know, if your heart is pure and, and your aim is true, then you can probably just get away with mixing Cuddle and, uh, and uh, the GPL. But I think in reality, people are afraid of doing that now, especially over the noise we've seen recently in the kernel. And I will name no names, but we all know of the Netfilter or debacle going on at the moment, which has now forced a new contributor statement on top of the kernel itself. And I think people are getting a bit frightened in general about GPL enforcement. Well, I mean, GPL enforcement is a real thing, but there are a couple of things to remember about it. One being that, you know, so far the only... There haven't been that many GPL enforcement suits, and all of the ones that have amounted to anything have come from a couple of key players in the SFC and the FSF. And, you know, they both have their their primary goal is education and, you know, partnerships with people to get them in compliance. And they kind of reserve in litigation as, you know, the big heavy stick if somebody doesn't want to comply and the question here is, you know, are they truly going to be motivated? Would it be a good idea for them to try to club somebody? And by somebody, let's just go ahead and say canonical uh, over the head for, you know, mixing these two pieces of free, if not libre, depending on how you know far down the rabbit hole you want to go. But ultimately, and this is also one of the reasons that, you know, the attorney I partnered with said that he thought this would stand up in the court. Uh, the preamble to the GPL is actually legally enforceable. It's part of the license, which is something that has driven people crazy for a while now because this, you know, highfalutin, uh, plain English, you know, statement about what the purpose of the GPL is to advance user freedoms and free software. That's not just like, you know, this sidebar, like, oh, this is kind of what we mean, but don't quote us on it in court. It's a legally enforceable part of the contract. Courts get to interpret that. So if you bring this to court, you're running the risk, uh, assuming you think this, of this as a risk because you don't want it interpreted that way, but you're running a very real risk that a judge is going to say, well, you know, I think that allowing users to use these two different pieces of very obviously free software together is completely compatible with what they said the goal of this thing was. Well, time has got away from us. Before we started, I said that it would fly by, and it certainly has. It's been great talking to you. Now is the chance for you to plug stuff. So what do you want to plug? I want to plug my project, Sanoid, which you can find the uh, GitHub repos the easy way at sanoid.net. If you just want like to see some fluffier things, like some videos of it in action, you can go to openoid.net, which is the uh, webpage of the company behind it. But in general, if you ever wanted to be able to take all your data and have automatic snapshots of every last bit of it taken uh, hourly, daily, and monthly expired for you without you having to worry about it and even replicate it uh, across the world on little teeny tiny internet connections in minutes, then that is absolutely going to be the project for you. And if people want to shout at you on Twitter for dissing BeachRFS, bring it <laughs> <laughs> at JRSSNet. Okay, cool. Well, I'll put links to that in the show notes. Thanks a lot for coming on and hopefully speak to you again at some point. All right. Thanks, Joe. Well, thank you very much, Jim. It was a great interview. Uh, it's nice when I get to listen to these guys doing the show rather than having to be on the show uh, and, uh, you know, clearly a very learned person. Um, I noted that there was, uh, you mentioned the fact that they're both ZFS and ButterFS are checksumming file systems. And that sounds like a really sensible thing for normal users. It means that you're less likely to have corruption and you can check for these things and what have you. And I know that I had a bit of a, uh, a qualm with this idea of scrubbing periodically to check the checksums and make sure that everything is uh, or hasn't corrupted and what have you. And I, it just sort of, I, I was annoyed that I wasn't on the interview because I, I couldn't ask him, but I did think that when you boot up every, I don't know, whatever it is, 10, 20 times, you know, and that um, FS check, F FFCK runs and, and checks your or my EXT4 file system, surely you just have that at the same time, you know, rather than having to get the user to do the scrub, why isn't it just there? I, I think that's sort of what he was getting at. Like, you'd put something like that on a system D timer, the same as you'd have, like, FS trim enabled, and have that run periodically once a week without actually doing it yourself. But, I mean, it has. It must be set up when... If I was to choose ZFS at my install, that should be set up straight away. In in my mind, as, as a dumb user thinking ZFS is a good idea. Yeah, I would agree with that. But that's sort of a distro integration detail versus 
the file system itself. But yeah, you'd, you'd sort of want that set up for the user. And it, it does take a good bit of time and it does take, you know, an impact on the box. You wouldn't want it like running every few hours or days. I mean, I had it on a system and it would take about 12 hours to do the check. So, oh. so you'd IO nice it to be quite slow and you'd set it off on a, you know, like an early Sunday morning or something like that and have that run all the Sunday and then get a report at the end of it. And then, yeah, okay, no errors, great. See, I did. I was hinting at this defrag in Windows, right? I was sort of getting a hint across, and I didn't realize it was that bad. Yeah, but instead of mangling your fucking data, this at least can recover the data and go, yeah, I fixed all these files that you had stored in that deep fucking directory structure and forgot were there. But, uh, right, you, you find that to be an important detail, and it recovers your data, and that's sort of cool, but... Does it show you like the little blue and white blocks? Then it shows an analysis <laughs> first that moves them around. Oh, that felt so good when it was it all nice not. and clean. <laughs> yeah, you get that big solid blue box. They're yes. all together. Why is that one there? Run it again. <laughs> What's that green bit? Why won't it move? <laughs> <laughs> what do the colours mean? <laughs> yeah, but they're together. Is it good that it's yellow? <laughs> So you've put something in the notes that I've just noticed here about running it on a NAS, Jesse. Yes, I mean, some of the things that he was talking about seemed very useful for having it on a NAS, on on having, you know, this uh, integrity of files and making sure that you can check them and and they don't uh, get corrupted. And I looked up um, Sanoid, the the software that he's produced for doing these incremental backups. And he said, I think it was every 30 for every hour and 30 for every day and then every week or something other. And it looks really clever. But the problem is, is that if you have multiple drives in uh, what would normally be RAID, but then with ZFS you get sort of um, virtual file systems and bits and bobs. For large companies who can throw money at the problem and say, give me a 200 terabyte set of files and you can just throw money at it. And then a year later, get rid of all those disks and put a whole load more in to get me 400 terabytes, fine. But for the the average home user... There isn't a nice, easy way of gently incrementing ZFS um, file or, or disk arrays without having to either buy all your disks up front for more than you expect to use or ditching all your disks that you just paid money for in a year and getting all new ones. You can't just like put a new terabyte disk in and then a year later put another two terabyte disk in because they all have to be the same. It does all these um, parity checks and bits and bobs across it and silvering, is it, where, where it checks and 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 remakes a drive. And uh, it, it just sort of makes the point that actually for a home user with a NAS, ZFS can be a little bit difficult. Now, he has actually mentioned later on that BSD Now saw his blog post and talked about it. And I agree with his comment that they didn't actually do very well at, at like making the case for ZFS. They basically said, you should use it because it's great and throw money at the problem. I, I don't think they really understood the, the problem of not having a lot of money and wanting every single gigabyte and terabyte to, to be used to its fullest. What? BSD people in being smug shocker. <laughs> 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 The thing is that those BSD people, they have got the money generally to buy loads of hardware. And as you say, don't really give a shit about spending a few hundred dollars on more discs. Whereas the average person who's like you, a little bit techie and realizes that you can have a NAS or whatever, then as you say, money is relatively tight on these things and you do want to squeeze all the space out of it you can. And so uh, well, what do you run in your NAS? Presumably that is just some sort of EXT4 or whatever. Uh, I'm in a grey area because you bang the disc in and you say, here's a disc and it does it for you. So I think it's one of these Synologies where it's using butter. Yeah, it's using butter then, yeah. Yeah, so I, but you don't even really get to choose. It just it just magically does it. But uh, yeah, I've, I've said what I need to say. I'm done. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> all right, well, I think we have all said what we need to say and we are all done. I didn't say anything. <laughs> oh, what, what do you want to dis uh, ZFS a bit more and big up P2FS? <sighs> I guess I couldn't. I don't have to, do I? <laughs> no, I don't have to. <laughs> all right, maybe another time. Um, all right, so we'll be back in a couple of weeks then. Uh, in the meantime, I have been Joe. I have been Jesse. 
I have been Ike. And I have been Phelan. Oh, you confusing pair of twats. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Shall we all speak the same anyway? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>